for the world. God sees everything, everywhere, all the time. Isn't that crazy? Could you imagine being God? Most of us not, right? Like <laughs> some of us sometimes feel like we are, but trust me, you're not, right? Like, like, like w- when we think about what God sees, what he experiences, his holiness and also just his sovereignty and his omnipresence. He's everywhere and he sees all people and he has a passion for everyone around the world. And, uh, and that's what we're talking about for us as New Hope. What does it mean for us to be for the world? See, I'm a little cut off on that camera shot, but that's all right. So, no, I'm just kidding. Thank you, Sean. Um, what does it look like for us as a church body to be for the world? And what opportunities has God been opening for us to, to, to reach out? Just like that Great Commission. We're going to talk about that in a second. And so we're going to talk about those things, opportunities that we have as a church body as a whole, opportunities that you're going to have individually to make an impact in the world that you live in and even across the seas and overseas, what you can do here in the town that you live in. And, um, and I, I tell you what, I can't, I can't wait to see what God's going to do by the end in, in all of us as we walk through this journey together. You see, that, that video was talking about a passage in the book of Acts. It's Acts 1.8. And uh, this is Jesus' words to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven. Right? So this is after he died on the cross for our sins, and he conquered death, rose from the dead, right? And now he was resurrected form, hanging out with the disciples, teaching, even it said at one time, to hundreds. And, um, and during that time, right before he ascends to heaven, he stops and has a conversation with the disciples. It's like, okay, now I'm really, I'm finally going. Here, here's your mission, if you show, should accept it, right? It's kind of like a dun, 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 kind of a thing. Um, but this is what he said in Acts 1.8. The words that he gave to them right before he ascended, he said, but you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. There's a great promise there because he's letting them know, I'm going, but don't worry, power's coming and you're about to receive it. Actually, today, all across the world, it's called Pentecost Sunday. It's where churches around the world remember and celebrate the fact that Jesus didn't leave and then just left us hanging. Like, okay, good luck, guys. Like, no, he sent the Holy Spirit down. And, and that was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit showed up and then the gospel just started going like crazy, right? God's church, the movement began. And that power showed up for the disciples and it is still here with us. He, the Holy Spirit, is with us, Christ followers, in us today. And his promise it was, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He gave them a mission. He's like, guys, you are going to be my witnesses. And they, they were, right? They were, they were first eye witnesses, right? They experienced Jesus. They saw it all. And they were now being sent to say, okay, now what you've seen, experienced, now you know who I am, the Messiah. You're going to be my witnesses. And you're going to go to Jerusalem, which you're like, we know that. That's our backyard. You know, we know Jerusalem. He said, okay, and then not that you're going to go to Judea. And that's kind of like a next ring of ge- geography for them. It was like, oh, we're going a little bit farther out. Okay. I think we can handle that. Us 11, right? At that point, it's 11 disciples, okay? He's like, okay, cool, that sounds good. And Samaria, and they're like, okay, that's a little bit broader now. We're talking a pretty big geographical area where it's going to take some work. And then Jesus just says, well, I tell you what, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, we got work to do, right? Like, I, I, I imagine yourself being one of the disciples as Jesus is saying this. You're thinking, okay, you're going to give us power. That's good news, okay? And now we're going to be your witnesses where? Yeah, in your backyard, and then a little bit farther out in your community, and then like a little bit farther beyond that, and then the whole earth. You need to be my witnesses. Now, the theologians have different interpretations of this passage. They make it personal. They say it was just for the disciples. Here's what I know. It shows God's heart that we, whoever we are as Christ followers, are his witnesses wherever we are, right? And that's, that's the power The Holy Spirit power was given to them so that they could be witnesses. They could spread the gospel message, the good news of what Christ has done. He died for your sins. He conquered death by conquering death, raising from the dead. And now he's alive today, seated on the throne. He's the king. And he did it so you can have a relationship with him. That's that's the good news in the gospel. Now, here's the thing. We have received the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christ follower, this promise has been given. And we have been given the mission to reach our community, Worcester, Wayne County, which for me, that number is 78,000 unchurched people. That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot of work to do to present the gospel 
to the state of Ohio, to our country, and then to the ends of the earth. That's our call. We, at New Hope Church, have a call to be a part of God's greater mission. And we're going to be learning his heart for the world and how us, together collectively, and you personally, can be involved and and engaged in the Great Commission. Okay? It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Now, when you think about things, when you think about for the world, you know, that whole phrase, our local and global impact, what we're going to be doing. Sometimes we think about like world missions and, um, and we remember things that we've seen maybe through commercials on TV or we see like a lot of bad things happen in the world, right? You watch the news in the Middle East, there's a lot of ugly, horrible things that happen, right? Um, there's, there's whole nations that have to be, um, leave their country as refugees because it's not safe. And so you have families, not just, not just adult men, but you have women, you have children who are fleeing to the unknown, into poverty. And you see news like that and you're like, wow, what's going on, right? You can get overwhelmed and then you, you turn on the TV and you're watching your fa- favorite movie and then all of a sudden a commercial comes on and the music's really kind of heavy and all of a sudden you see a, a, a kid usually darker skinned, wearing like really scraggly clothes with the eyes that are just perfectly like teared up. And, and they're saying, what are you going to do to help that kid, right? And, and you're moved, you know, like something's moving you and we either have a choice. And, and I would say a lot of us in this room, the choice is mute, right? Just, I'm being honest, like it, it's comical because it's real, Right. Like mute or well, let's see what's going on on ESPN, right? Or like uh, I'll come back to the movie in a minute. Uh, because there's something that happens to us. When we see things like that, we see injustice around the world. Um, imagine being God. He sees all the injustice that happens around the world all the time. Millions and millions of people that are being treated not the way God would want them to be, but as a broken world does. People in poverty, people in need, you know, people being... Um, mistreated, being sold, and slavery. Man, what, just the emotions attached to that. I know this is what it does with God, right? We talked about mood swingers and that God has emotions. You know, he shows emo- anger, you know, all that kind of stuff, love, compassion. Like God, when he sees that, is moved with two things, anger towards those that can do something about it and compassion to those who are broken in the situation. And he's moved in all those ways all the time. When we see that stuff as, as humans, right, as, as a person who has a home, has a family, has kids of our own maybe, or, or as people that we love, and when we see and, and, and feel those things, a lot of times um, we just want to turn off the emotions attached to it. There's actually a psychological um, phrase that psychologists have given what happens to us when we see those things and we get overwhelmed by those circumstances. Um, it's called psychic numbing. We turn off our emotions, and we make it something that isn't us. It doesn't have to do with me. And, uh, and so we kind of numb our emotions so we don't have to feel the weight of what that experience is. Now, is there anything wrong with that? I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think sometimes that's a natural protective for our own hearts and souls at times. But I think sometimes it can actually pull us away from God's heart, you know, in certain circumstances for people. And so it can have its good. It can have its bad. Um, because here's what happens. We see needs like that, and it's like the need is huge. I mean, it's, there are some big needs, and the question is, what can I do about it, right? And you feel like it's too overwhelming, I'm too small, and so I, need, I can't, right? I just can't deal with it. And, and here's my hope for this series, okay, is that we wouldn't move ourselves towards psychic numbing where it's kind of like we turn off our emotions and circumstances. I'm hoping that we can actually see real tangible things and real tangible people that God would have us be moved to compassion to help. Because the need's big and God knows the need. He's, he's staring at it every single day. And he's sitting there saying, I know the need and I also know the people who can fulfill it, but they're just sitting on it. See, the, the issue with like poverty around the world is not a God provision issue. It's a people distribution issue. God's given everybody everything they need. It's just a lot of people have more than they need and they keep it so they can sit on their need, right? Um, really on their wants. So we, I want us to be moved to see what God sees and to see where God might ask you, me, individually, personally, 
where we can be moved with compassion and actually make a difference. Let's not be overwhelmed. Let's be overjoyed that we're invited to God's great commission. Let's do something about it, okay? And so we're going to learn about some of the to-dos, some of the things that we get to do, okay? Now, this morning's message, I'm just painting the picture, okay? This is foundational, and I want us to get into a story in the Old Testament to see God's heart, okay? Um, So if you have your Bibles, every week I say, bring your Bibles, Great job saying it, right? All right, bring your Bibles. And uh, I always read it up here, but I always encourage you, open it on your own or go on your f- app on your phone. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's in the Old Testament. If you have to use your table of contents in the Bible, don't feel embarrassed. That's why it's there, because there's a lot of books in this bigger book called the Bible, okay? And we're going to be reading about a couple of characters. Let me paint the picture of some of the characters in, in, in what's happening at this point in history with Israel. There's a king who's ruling over Israel. He was the first king. His name was King Saul. And at the beginning, Saul was a good king. He he feared God. He wanted to live for God and and king and be a king over God's people in in a right way. But later on in his life, it went south, right? As so often things in our life, when things go good, what happens to us? Pride usually gets in the way, right? Look at me. Look at the good things I'm doing. Well, Saul, he went to a point where he wasn't walking with God, and actually God removed his anointing from King Saul, meaning God's favor was not on King Saul any longer because of his disobedience, because of his selfish, because of his pride. And King Saul knew it, but he was still charging full force with who he was and what he was doing. And actually, at the end, he was crazy. Like the, he, There was some like crazy emotional responses of circumstances. And one of them was because of this, this little guy by the name of David, you guys know this guy in the Old Testament. I mean, we're talking, David is like a major character in the history of God's people and even with us, right? It's David's lineage where Christ came through. David's li- like, big deal. David's a big character, okay? But David, before he was a big character, he was a small boy. I don't know how small he was. He was probably strong, but in his family, he was the least. He was the youngest. And, um, and he was born to be a shepherd, I mean, he was there to take care of the family sheep or even other sheep. And that job is not a glamorous job. You're hanging out with sheep, right? Sheep are dirty. They smell. They, they poo, right? They, they, they don't, they're, they're pretty stupid. So as a shepherd, you have to take care of them, everything about them, right? So his job was to be with the sheep all the time. He was there taking care of them, trying to help them when they, like, get injured. He protect them. Like if lions or something came and attacked, we learned some of those stories about David, he would take those animals out to protect his sheep. So there was a fierceness to him, but he was considered the least of his family. Well, God's anointing had left Saul and God was looking for who is the next king? Who is the one that I'm going to anoint to lead my people as king? And he shows up to David's family, David's dad. He's like, all right, Uh, Samuel, the prophet's coming to anoint who is going to be the next king. And Samuel, he brings out all his best boys. He's like, all right, here they are. Here's my, here, one of these guys, one of my sons is going to be king. This is awesome. And, uh, and Samuel's like, no, God says, no, God says, no, God says, no. He's like, is there somebody else missing? It's like, oh, well, David, he's out taking care of the sheep, you know, as if like, why would you pick him? And Samuel says, oh, go get David. And David is the one God chooses to be the next king over Israel and anoints him. So now David, the one who is destined to be a shepherd, now just got a new assignment. Oh, you're going to be king. Transition, right? Transition. Did it happen instantly? No, it did not. It got crazy in the process. Because then, you know, you know, some of the stories in there with David, like he went and then killed this big giant named Goliath. You guys remember that story? Like, and so like his fame actually started to rise as like the young guy um, just took out the biggest guy that we're all freaking scared of. And oh my gosh. So he rose to like warrior status and people, he became like a man's man at that point. And, and, and in this whole journey, Saul knew that God's anointing left him. David's calling as the next king. Saul went crazy. Now in this process, David was, became best friends with Jonathan which is Saul's son, the prince. And if you want to read about what it means to be a friend, I mean, like two guys in a brotherhood, like I will die, I will fight, I love each other as brothers. That's Jonathan and David. 
This whole story is like twisted because Jonathan's dad, Saul, goes crazy and is trying to kill David, hunting him down. And so David is the next king, but he's running for his life thinking Saul's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. This is over with. And he was running in fear. Some of the Psalms you can read in those moments. Um, so you have this thing playing out in these relationships. Well, fast forward a little bit. Saul and Jonathan were in a battle. They were still trying to take over territory. They were still trying to expand the kingdom, all that kind of stuff. And there was a battle where Saul and Jonathan both got killed. The king and the prince got killed in battle. Now, David is right here, next in line to be king. Whenever there is a change of king (laughs) and a new king comes in and the old king's family is still present, it was historical, like this is what they would do, that king would come into reign and kill the other family so that there was no attack or no threat to the new kingdom and the new king. And that's what went down. So fear, when Jonathan and and Saul, the king, were, were killed in battle, all of a sudden fear in Saul's family just took over. Rightfully so. They're like, the next king has a right to take us all out. Any heir to the throne would be just, he would be killed. He'd be murdered. And um, you can read about that story. But there's something that happened when all this went down. Um, Because uh, part of Jonathan's family, he had a son. And the son was young. He was five years old. We'll read, this is in chapter four. So you don't have to go there. You can read this with me. When, when they found out that Saul and um, Jonathan were both killed in battle, it says he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse, this is Jonathan's son, his nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. He's now crippled. By no Nothing he did, right? Everything's okay. Life's going okay. My grandfather's the king. My dad's the prince. Life is good. They're living in royalty. They die. Chaos breaks out. And his nurse, trying to leave, just trying to get out because he knows what's coming next. And Mephibosheth's um, story was going to be that he was going to get killed so that there was no threat to the line of the king. And in that process, she drops him and he becomes a cripple. Now, in this point of history... If you were crippled, there was no hope for you. You were set aside in society. You would be put out to the edge of the city and the rest of your life was just to beg for help. And everybody would see and have pity and you would feel like life, you are a lesser than human being. The one who is going to be king in line to be king now has a completely different condition. He's cast out. And not by his own fault. Have you ever gone through something in life where you felt like life handed you a bad deck, right? Your hand, when you looked at it, you know, you're playing the game of life. It's like, this is horrible. And it wasn't by anything that you did. It's just because life happened. And maybe you felt like Mephibosheth. It wasn't my fault, but man, I am in a hole emotionally. We're going to see in a moment what happens in this story because it doesn't end here. We're, we're learning today about David, a man with a position now, and Mephibosheth, a man with a condition. And we're going to see what God does in the midst of it, okay? So skip ahead a number of years, a number of years to chapter 9 with these two characters, David and Mephibosheth, okay? Everybody with me? Okay. Pulling you into the story here. So David asked And we don't know, like at this point, what David was doing. We know that at this point, David is ruling as king. He's honoring God. Actually, in one part, God says, he's a man after my own heart. And so he's living for God, and he is ruling as king. That means he is the final word. Anybody comes before David, you do what he says. He's large and in charge, okay? And maybe he was thinking back to his friendship with Jonathan and just remembering. And he may have remembered a promise he made to his best friend. Where Jonathan asked, hey, if, not if, when you become king, because Jonathan knew, when you become king, don't forget my family and to show kindness. So we don't know if he was doing something that reminded him of his friend and it's like, oh yeah, I remember this promise. But it says, David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness 
for Jonathan's sake, for his friend's sake. He's like, is there anybody left in Saul's family? And so, uh, so it says this, now there was a servant of Saul's, of the old king, uh, Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, which I think would be a little fearful, wouldn't it be? Like, I was the one that served the old king, and now the new king, it's been a while, but now he's summoning me out of nowhere to come to him. What does he want, right? Like, what's going on here? At your service. He says, are you Ziba at your service? Which I think is the response before the king, no matter what, right? Like, if he says, hey, Tim, at your service, right? Like, what, have, what do you got? You know, what do you need? Um, at your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? He asked the same question of Ziba. And Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. It's like, wait a minute. Like, I thought all that was taken care of, right? Like, but he's still hunting out with somebody hidden. He is lame in both feet. Now we don't, we can read into the story here right? A little bit, but we don't know what the tone of voice was when Ziba was saying this, right? We don't know if it was that he was like, um, yeah, there is, um, he, don't worry, he's lame in both feet. If he's like trying to say to David, there is, there is another heir to the throne of Saul, um, but don't worry, um, he's lame in both feet, which means there's no way he could ever serve as king. He's kind of disqualified. So don't worry about him. You know, that's kind of the inference as I, as I read it. Like, yeah, but he's lame on both feet. Because why mention that? Unless you're saying something to David. Where is he? The king asked. And Ziba answered, he is out the house of Makur, son of Am- Amiel, in Lodabar. Great, great, uh, great town reign. Lodabar. Sounds like when you're doing limbo. Come on now. Lodabar, right? Like, here we go. <laughs> Low Debar. We just like to have a little fun around here. All right, right. So it's Low Debar is the town that he's in. Now, um, theologians, scholars have some different views, but the, the name of the town, Low Debar, means like, like town of no pasture. Like there's no fields, there's no pastures. And, um, and some believe that, that what they're saying when they say that is it's like us saying today, oh, oh yeah, he lives out in Nowheresville, right? It's like, it's like a town of no consequence. Like we don't even mention it. It's like, yeah, he's lost in Timbuktu somewhere, right? That's what, that's what they believe that he's saying right now. He's saying, so, so what you're telling me is that there's this other son, um, he's lame, and because of that, he's been cast out to Nowheresville. Right? Have you ever felt that way? Like, things aren't going well. I feel like I've just been cast out. To, like, nobody knows where I'm at. He's been hidden. He's been hidden from society. He's been hidden from culture. He's been hidden from the king. And David has some choices. What is he going to do now that he knows that there's this other son living out there in Lodabar? So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from Nowheresville, from the house of Makur, son of Amiel. What do you think right now if you were in Mephibosheth's shoes? Well, you'd be lame, right? Um, The the king who you were actually heir to sit on that throne is now calling you. He hasn't talked to you. You've been gone for years and years and years. And now he's calling you to come to the palace. What would you be feeling? Fear, right? Anxiousness. Why is the king calling me now? I've been hidden out here. nowhere. I've been doing fine. And for him, it sounds like he had a family who was taking care of his needs. He couldn't take care of himself. He was living with a family who was taking care of his needs and being sure he was taken care of, right? Fear, I would think, would be an emotion definitely attached to this. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, that, those are very powerful words, right? It's reproclaiming this guy was on his way to become king. When he came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, exclamation mark. He's like, Mephibosheth. And he says, at your service, he replied, right? He humbles himself before King David and rightfully so. He's the king. Ziba did it at your service, at your service, king. And he's humbling himself to pay him honor. He replied, you know, at your service, he replied, don't be afraid, David said to him. 
that, those words are powerful words, right? Because he's coming very afraid and rightfully so. And then David's first word, Mephibosheth. It's like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And watch what David does. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Now listen, this is crazy. It's ridiculous, right? I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and, all, and you will always eat at my table. Those words hitting Mephibosheth's ears. It's like, wait a minute. I was coming here to get killed. Like, I thought that was going to be the, the call here. Uh, what's happening? And what did you say? Right? Like, like you're saying, um, I'm so glad you're here. Don't be afraid. I'm giving you everything that you deserved to get as the grandson of the king. You get all his land. All of what Saul had is yours. And you will always eat at my table. I'm telling you, eating at the king's table, that's a big deal. Not anybody's invited to that table. Let's keep reading. Mephibosheth bowed down. So he was already down, but he bowed down, I'm thinking a little lower, and said, listen to his attitude and his heart. What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Now we see his heart, right? He's lived years separated out in Nowheresville. Physically, he was lame. He had a condition. He could not take care of himself. And so he knew that. But we see here his condition was way beyond his physical. It was the way he thought. It's the way he felt. He spoke of his own self. I am a dead dog. I'm worthless. Why would you want me? You can't be talking to me. I don't know if you've ever been at a point in your life in the pit where you have felt like Mephibosheth. In that moment, I am a dead dog. Woe is me. I'm worthless. And yet, we see David's response. And I think we learn about God's heart for those who are broken. Not just physically, but in spirit and in thought we see David's response to Mephibosheth in this moment. Listen to, listen to this. This is so cool. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. D- okay, do you notice what just happened? I am like a dead dog. David's like, Whatever. Hey, I'm giving him everything that belongs to him. It's like he just, he just ignores it. He's like, I'm sorry that you believe that lie. That's not who you are. And I'm restoring you right now to who you are. That's what God does to us. When we think we are worthless, useless, we think what has been done to us puts us in a moment of shame or what we have done puts us in a place of darkness and shame. And no way the God of the universe, the king of the world would invite me to his table. No. And God hears your words and sees your brokenness and says, oh, I'm sorry. That's not who I see you as. I have a greater invitation. I'm going to restore to you all that I want to give you. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what I think. Some of us need to hear the words of God. Okay? David says to him, yeah, that's not we're not going there. No. Hey, Zeba, come on, come over here. Um, all the stuff you've been taking care of that was Saul's land now belongs to him. It's his. He is his grandson. It's being restored to him. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, he keeps repeating it over and over and over again, I think on purpose. He's reminding him who you are. This is who you are, Mephibosheth. This is who you are. Keep hearing it because I'm telling Ziba, listen in. This is who you are. This is what you're getting. Um, Your grandson of your master will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 
It's like winning the lottery, right? He's like, he's like, you went from nothing, from nowheresville, from low to bar, right? And now you're like in the king's palace and the king's saying, you're eating at my table every day and you're getting everything that your grandfather owned. It's yours. And uh, Ziba and all his kids and his servants now work for you. Dang, right? <laughs> Going from not to a lot, right? Like that's, that's, that's the condition that he's experiencing right now with David. Verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. That's an interesting sentence because it really just sounds like Ziba wasn't very thrilled about this, right? It's more like he's saying, I'll do what you tell me I got to do, right? He's like, "Uh, okay. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah or Micah. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. Whose table did he eat at? The king's table. He was lame in both feet. Just a final reminder of his physical condition. See, in this story, we see David who has position. We see Mephibosheth who has a condition. And we see kindness and compassion overrule brokenness and dishonor. You want to know the heart of God. That's what he sees. He sees those who are broken. He sees those in poverty. He sees the widows. He sees the orphans. And he is moved with kindness and compassion. And he calls us to be like the man who has a position. That's us. That's you and me. We, where we live, have been given insane position in this world. Insane position. This is, I just, you can even write this down, all right? God has given you great position. You are like King David. And some of you are like, I don't feel like King David, right? And I don't, that's him, you should see my checking account. And I should say, you should see mine as well, right? Um, there have been many times where I have had little, very little, um, my needs have always been taken care of because God is a God of provision, but I have had very little. I have had my electric turned off and figuring out how to burn candles for a few days so we can pay to get it turned back on. I have had water shut off because then we'd fill up the hot, or not the hot, we didn't have a hot tub. That would have been awesome. We didn't have one of those. We had a bathtub. We'd fill the bathtub with water, and we, if we needed it, we would boil and use it for other things because we couldn't afford to get our water turned back. I've been there. Even in my poorest moment, I was insanely wealthy in comparison to the rest of the world. Think about this, all right? Where we live today, in, in Ohio, in the community that we live in, the, uh, the income that's labeled as um, being um, below poverty, it's right around 36000 for a year is, is the number I found. So, and that's different family sizes, that kind of stuff, but around 36000 So if you live in poverty here in the United States, um, compared to an area that we're going to be making an impact in the Dominican Republic, your level of poverty is 400 times richer than a family in poverty in the Dominican, in the community that we're going to be making a difference in. 400 times. If you think you have not been put in a time and in a place and in a location to be one who has position, you need a wake-up call. We are in a position And God is going to open our eyes for people, individuals who are in a condition, a situation that you and I can be a part of showing the kindness of God to. We get to be David. I'm telling you, it's a, it's pretty fun to be David in this story. It's pretty fun to like speak truth and life into somebody who's been bogged down and lived in a lie, in oppression, I want us to be open to that, guys. That's it. This this sermon is just, I want us to be open to that. See, when God sees the broken, the poor, the needy, the orphan, the widow, the poverty, his word is never shame. It's not like, well, you did it to yourself. You were born there. It's your fault. No. He shows that same heart and has compassion. Shows kindness, 
brings provision day by day. And he asks us to be a part of it. Would you pray this week? God, open my eyes to see what you see. And God, break my heart for what breaks yours. That is one of the most dangerous prayers you will ever pray. It will cause us to act and to act like God and to be like Christ and to be moved with compassion. I think this week, this is that prayer. I think this week we need to be like David who was reminded of his good friend, Jonathan. And in his reminder, it was like a God moment of God. I made a promise to my friend. And so he asks the question, is there anybody from the family of Saul that I can show kindness to? I think the question that we need to ask through this whole series is this. Is there anyone whom I can show kindness to for God's sake? Not Jonathan's sake, not family. Like, is there anyone whom I can show kindness to for the sake of my God? I don't want credit. I don't want glory. I don't want, I want to invite somebody to come to the king's table. Because God invites us all. God invites us all. So God, this week and through this series, as we move into this, as we um, look at your heart and see the bigger picture of what you want to do for this world, I pray right now, God, that you would open us up. That we wouldn't move towards that psychic numbing, that kind of emotional numbing when we think it's too big, it's too great, I can't do anything about it. God, help us push that aside. Help us see what we can do, who you have put right next to us probably this week that we can show your kindness to. Whether it's a small moment of provision or blessing or whether it's us being a part of a gathering like this where all of us come together to make a bigger blessing to a whole community. Open our hearts, open our eyes to see the Mephibosheths around us. And invite them to your table. God, here we are. Send us. Send us. Now we're going to respond this morning in a reminder for us who are in Christ. That we, you and I, have been invited to the king's table. You can look up here just for a moment because we're about to take communion. And as we take communion, it is the reminder of the table. It's the reminder of what Christ has done for us. It's the reminder of the gospel, the good news that we've been commissioned to preach. And that good news is wrapped around us being Mephibosheth. Honestly, we are Mephibosheth with God. That's us. Why? Number one, we are fallen and broken, right? Romans 3.23, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned, meaning we haven't earned our way to the king's table. We haven't been good enough. We haven't, we can't do it. We are all broken and we are all sinners. And yet we are pursued by the king, the king of the world, the king of the universe, the great king, God himself. We are pursued by that king, not David to Mephibosheth, our holy God to us pursuing us and inviting us to his table, to eat at his table, right? John 3, 17, we know 16, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. It wasn't to shame, it wasn't to finally just be like, it's over with, no. He sent his son to save it, to save you and to save me. That is the pursuit of a king who loves his people. And with that, when we come to the table, I love this image, of coming to the king's table. Because at once, once a day, when Mephibosheth came to David's palace to eat, and he sat amongst all the others at that table, the table covered his brokenness. He was one of the equals. In the same way, what we are going to partake in, what Christ has done for us, is us coming to the king's table, and that sacrifice Jesus on the cross covers our sin as if it's not there. It's so cool, isn't it? We've been invited to the king's table. We are Mephibosheth. And so when we do this, when we take communion, it is that reminder 
of what God has done for us to pursue us, to give us forgiveness of sins. Now, some of you in this room, you have not walked into that invitation of the king yet. Some of you in this room, you haven't said, you know what, I believe Jesus is the son of God. You haven't made that confession. We see in scripture, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart, right? That he is the son of God, that, that you will be saved. It's your own relationship and acceptance of the invitation from the king. And today, if you want to take that step and say, I know I need that. I know I need forgiveness of my sins. I can't earn it. I want a relationship with God. We're going to pray in just a couple of minutes and you can pray right along with us, okay? And you can say, I want Christ in my life and invite him in. It's your own words. It's your own confession. There's no magical like pastor said and I'm good. No, it's you and your relationship with the king, with God, okay? For the rest of us in this room, we're all going to pray this out loud together to remind ourselves that we've been invited. To remind ourselves that we have, our sins, when we come to that table, our sins are covered. And it's not because of what we've done. So this is what we do with communion. There's bread and there's juice. And Christ gave us this example as he did it with his disciples. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And that's what the bread represents. The fact that his body was broken and the cup, the juice represents the blood that was shed for us. That was the cost of sin. And he canceled that debt for you and me. And that's what this represents for us who are in Christ Jesus. All who are Christ followers can join us at the table. If you haven't yet, I would encourage you to just stay in your seat and that's okay. But if you want to take a step into salvation and the invitation to the king's table, I want you to pray with us. And you can join us right at the table today. You don't have to wait. So let's stand together, church. Um, We're going to release you in just a moment, and we're going to sing a song together after we take communion. Um, And so there's a table here. There's two tables in those back corners on either side. Um, We're going to release you in a moment. You can go to whatever table you feel comfortable with, grab those elements, and then take them back to your seat. And as you do that, I always encourage you to just stop and hold them and pray. And just say, God, thank you for this. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the forgiveness I have. Thank you for inviting me to your table. And then you can take the communion, take the bread, take the cup. And, uh, and just be in his presence as you do that. We do use gluten-free bread because we want everybody to be able to participate together. We don't want any barriers for communion. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to pray out loud. And again, if you want to start a relationship with Christ, you want to invite him in, you pray this out loud with us. Those of you who are Christ followers, let's pray this out loud as our, our, our uh, profession of what Christ has done for us. So let's pray together. Say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for my sin. It should have been me. Please forgive me of my sins. I give you my life here and forever. I'm yours. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May God, as we come to these tables, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for the invitation. And I pray that you would just, Holy Spirit, just meet us in this time and encourage our hearts as we come to the table of communion.